Good afternoon. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. I have just gotten back from an amazing three days uh, right here in Washington, D.C. with the survivors of internet of institutional abuse convention. Excuse me. There's international abuse as well. Actually, in some ways, the institutional abuse is much more frightening because I think we're used to, as Americans to hearing horrific stories from abroad. There's massacres in Syria. I've gone on air. I've talked about them. Uh, there's hor- horrors going on in North Korea. And as horrific and awful as those things are, and as much as I strive uh, to to help the people of Syria or to uh, try to get rid of the, the terrible dictator in North Korea, there's something, I don't know, there's a special pit in my stomach and a special, uh, I don't know, hardness, I guess, that, that hits my heart pretty bad when I hear this stuff going on in the United States of America. Because I guess I expect other countries to have brutal dictators that mistreat or torture or abuse children. I don't expect it to happen in the United States. And what I've been learning through my work with the Survivors of Institutional Abuse and HEAL and CAFT and other organizations that care about the ethical treatment of children, is, and it may astonish you, is that we actually mistreat children worse than we do adults. Now, that may surprise a lot of you because you think, well, a child obviously is in a much more helpless situation. Uh, you know, you would think, well, if we're going to be harsh on anyone, right, you're going to be harsh on an adult, if you've got your, you know, your husband wants some food or or your child, you'll probably feed your child first. Your husband can go out and get some more food if he needs some, right? If if it's something, if it's a a very strong punishment in the legal system in prison, you know, you kill someone and you're an adult, you're put away for life, you get the death penalty. You kill someone and you're 12 years old. A lot of times you're put in juvenile detention and then you can get out and rejoin your life. We are harder, we think, in our minds on adults than we are on children. That just makes sense. Children are just growing up. They are learning. They are not as strong as adults. They need our help. So what it surprised you to know, because it surprised me, that tens of thousands of kids all across America are being treated worse than we ever treat a prisoner, an adult prisoner behind bars, and these are kids who've committed no crimes. If you don't believe me, stick around because we're going to have a whole bunch of survivors of institutional abuse on this show, and they're going to tell you stories that they're just going to break your heart. They've broken mine because, you know, I don't support abuse of adults. I don't support torture of adults. But children? Torturing children? Is there anything more cruel and wrong than torturing and abusing children? Enough of me. Let me get to some of the people that... uh, well, that have suffered this and are so brave and so courageous. The person that I have next to me, Janine, uh, I met her last year at the uh, the first uh, uh, Survivors Convention, and this is uh, a, a a woman who will tell you. I mean, you, you said you have you have stage fright, right? I so, do. so, so the <laughs> fact that you're coming here on radio that's that's extraordinary, and I'm I'm really honored to have you here today. Janine, tell me a little bit about your story. Where where were you placed? I was um, placed in the Victory Christian Academy. And it was a reform school. The Victory Christian Academy. Now, where is that located? It was located in Ramona, California. And uh, how did you get there? What, why did your parents send you there? Um, I consider it a kidnapping. Um, I had a 3.5 grade point average in school. That's very good. Thank That's you. like an A minus average. That's I very good. So. I thought so, too. Absolutely. I, I actually wanted to be in a Christian private school, and my parents placed me in there. And Speak I, really close into the mic. Oh, okay. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> I had a 3.5 grade point average in school, and I had I was a strong Christian. I I even had I love God on my my folder. Okay. Um, no drinking, no alcohol. Um, sounds almost, like you're a good kid. Almost like a goody two shoes. That's, I say right. uh, I say almost. All right. Well, I mean, look. I mean, that's great. You're, so you're a model student. All right. And so you wanted to go this place originally. You didn't know what it was all about. I'm sure. Uh, the private school that I was at, that is the place I wanted to be. But um, I, I confronted my parents about sexual abuse that was happening oh my in, God. in the family, and they didn't believe me. And of course... So, so you, I, I don't mean to pry, but you were sexually abused. I was sexually abused by a family by member. By a family member. And you said, hey, this family member has molested me. Right. And they didn't believe you. They didn't believe me. I was I was on the stand. I was in a trial, our personal family trial, basically. Right. How old were you at the time? I was 16 years old. And so the time of the abuse happened when I was 15. And you uh, confront your parents and you say, hey, this guy in the family 
raped me, you would think you come to mom and dad, you'd get a lot of sympathy. Right. And you didn't get that. I didn't get that. I didn't get the proper um, treatment that I needed for that counseling. Um, basically, what they did was um, they had told me they were going to, they tricked me into it and said they were going to take me to a psychiatrist. And I believe them. And um, they took me to Ramona, California. It was a 12 foot fence with barbed wire. And wow. it was too late. I was already inside the gate. I, th this is astonishing because you've been raped. You've been victimized. That in itself, all by itself, is a horrific crime for which we put people away for the rest of their lives. You then come home to your parents to tell them, uh, of course that's who you'd come home to, to your parents to say, hey, this guy raped me. And they victimize you further by not believing you and not trusting you. And then you're sent away to a prison camp and, and, and you're a complete victim here. That, it's amazing that this is legal in America. So tell us about the camp. What was, what was Victory Christian Academy like? So excluding the torment that I experienced at Victory, um, let's just take it to the stop at the gate. I would say that that was far worse than the actual sexual abuse I, I experienced. I feel that I was so betrayed by my parents. And then just take me to the gate, just to the gate and then leave me there at victory. That was the biggest betrayal that I... So they just like pushed you out of the car and said, bye. I mean, I don't, I don't, how did, I don't want to put words in your mouth. How did it happen? Um, so basically to the point where I, they had taken me, of course, when they put me on the trial stand at home, you know, prove it, prove it. I, I was getting angry naturally and sure. crying and sure. upset. Sure. So, you know, they just thought I was an out of control teenager, you know. Even though you were a kid with a three point five average, who's a goody two shoes at school, right? Did they ever consider that maybe this family member had in fact raped you? It was. They kept going back and forth. It would. It would either be I don't believe you. You're lying. You're just doing this for attention. Or my daughter's wild. Did you have a good relationship with your parents prior to this incident? No. No. That's didn't. why I ended up. So so I mean, living with. Family, if, other family members. If you don't mind, so you, even before you confronted them with right. the incident, there you've was been problem. placed. To, so your parents basically, let's face it, weren't very good parents. Right. And 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 that's part of what we're dealing with here. Not every parent is a good parent. Not every parent should have a child. All right. So you're placed in this institution, Victory Christian Academy. How long were you there? I w I was supposed to be there for a year, and lucky for me, I got out after eight months. But the first month of being there, the damage was already done. Describe what happens. you got to understand, very few people have been in these places, and we really don't know what goes on there. So please explain what a frightened, sexually molested 16-year-old girl is dropped off by her parents, who's been betrayed by them. What do you see when you get there? I mean, your mind must be whirling already before you even walk in the door. Um, a preacher by the name of Michael Palmer took me into his office with my parents, and said, you have given your parents enough trouble. Um, you were here for a year. And they knew that this, they knew it because they knew where they sent me, that this was a reform school because obviously it was for troubled kids because he specifically said, you gave them trouble. And I said, how could you do this to me? How could you do this to me? And they took, the other staff had taken me back to the showers and they physically and, grabbed you. I mean, I assume you didn't want to go. I didn't want to go, but I really didn't put a fu fuss in because I knew what the repercussions would be. You could figure that out I already. could figure that out. So I, I just went along with the program because I knew that if I were to try to run, I would be tackled or, or worse. What did you see happen while you were there in the eight months? What happened to other girls? What, what, what kinds of... Uh, abuses that I you see go on I actually have the one the most horrific thing that I actually witnessed that I, I actually put in a letter to Congress is a girl a 13 year old girl being tormented in the name of God by the way you know please let me reiterate that this is a Christian reform school you couldn't just do whatever you wanted this was a boot camp slash concentration camp slash cult you, girls were around 
in a circle, and inside the circle was a 13-year-old girl with duct tape over her mouth, crying. Her hands were behind her back, handcuffed. She was bound to a chair. I thought one of the other girls had put her in there. To my amazement, it was all orchestrated by a staff member. I, I was horrified. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't save this girl. I couldn't go to my bunk and say, you know, excuse me, I want to go read my Bible. I don't want to participate in this. You had to participate in this. You had to watch. So so it wasn't just that this girl was clearly tortured and abused. You had to watch it. I had it. to watch it and not say anything because if I said something, if I, I tried to help her, if I took the duct tape off of her, I would be the one in, in a solitary confinement or maybe even just like her in a circle so what are some of the things they did they put they put uh, the girls who would not comply they put them in solitary in solitary confinement anything with food or or shelter or and in some of these cases we're going to talk to some other survivors they, they were locked in closets or or um, uh, forced on marches anything like that um, yes let me back up sure to the let's go back to the 13 year old girl in the yeah, circle and please. I'll I'll close with this. She was in a circle crying. She could have suffocated. That's true. Um, all the girls in the circle were going around saying something derogatory about her. Oh, my God. Lowering her self-esteem. Uh, in the name of God. This oh. is in the name of God. How can you slap on your title, Christian Academy? How can you do that? I, uh, I just... I just cannot believe that this is happening in America. And it's not just this school, it's many. All right, let's move on to solitary confinement. I was actually locked up in solitary confinement the first time I got there, and I was locked in there for eight hours. Um, a preaching tape was going on, and that's when I figured out they were abusing the girls in there. I knew they were abusing because I heard the sermons. And that, to me, was not Christian. I've never heard that in a church before in my life. It was an independent fundamental Baptist, and I didn't realize what the hell, where the hell I was or what this denomination was until I actually got out. And, and what, was, what was in those tapes? What kinds of things? Um, basically, this preacher was calling the girls whores, um, blaming them for being raped it was their fault were you blamed for being raped yes by by them i you actually told them what happened and i they... i tried thinking that they were rational people no they actually sat down and had me pray to god asking god to forgive me as if you'd done something as wrong. if i've done something wrong any rape counselor would have I don't know. It just what is this, went off on them. What does this do to your brain? I mean, you're trained that being Christian is good. You're a good religious girl. You you have I love God. Uh, you know you you believe in this, and you certainly believe rape is bad. You're you 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 learn normal things, and suddenly you're in this topsy turvy world where your parents are your enemies, where the rapist is to be forgiven, where Christian people are treating you badly and asking you to 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 seek forgiveness i mean how does that affect your brain when what you've known all your life is right and wrong is suddenly reversed right how does that did you have a breakdown i mean how does that how do i you deal with i that? couldn't even have a breakdown at this place they wouldn't even let you react you were like a soldier in the middle of a war you couldn't even react you had no time to react if you reacted they would punish you further and, and, and give me again some of the punishments. So they're solitary. What were some um, of the things they would do? Verbally abuse you in chapel, call you out. So in the middle of chapel, a preacher would call you out or call you a heathen. Um, again, the solitary confinement, um, standing a girl for hours, days at a time in front of a pole. So wait, now standing. So the girl had to stand up in front of a pole. In, just In front of a pole and, and just. Hours on end. Hours on end. It's not easy to stand up for hours on end. And, and what happens if she, she couldn't, she wanted to sit down? Solitary confinement or you, other punishments. You know, it's interesting. Um, John McCain has talked about the fact of how horrible solitary confinement is. We actually, as prisoners, there are restrictions on how much you can place a hardened murderer in solitary because it's seen as a particularly harmful and damaging 
treatment, and yet they were doing it to to teenage girls. Yes. Um, I also want to uh, talk about the buddy system sure. too. Um, it was the big the biggest form of degradation to me. I had when I first got there, I had to be on buddy for a month. And what buddy is is that you follow a girl for one month, three feet behind. You were three feet behind, so it was almost like an invisible dog leash. In fact, they went a step further that if you got out of the three feet and fell behind, they would actually put a dog leash on your wrist to the to the buddy. So it's all about control and degradation. Yes. Now, what's interesting is I assume your buddy was a fellow. I guess the word is inmate or or or, or right. Troubled. Another student. In Another. fact, my buddy was twelve years old, and I was sixteen. So huh. this is another student. <laughs> and well, is, is she ordering you around now, this 12-year-old? Pretty much telling me the rules, what what to be expected, what I can say, what I cannot say. Freedom of speech was taken from me. I couldn't talk to any of the girls. I couldn't look them in the eye. What happens if you looked them in the eye? I would get punished. You would get punished. With Things like a demer- solitary. A demerit, solitary confinement. Um demerits were i will not look at another girl i will not look at another girl a hundred times sometimes 500 times so after eight months when you get out of a place like this how does that affect you for the rest of your life you're you're a a, a beautiful woman you have a wonderful husband i've met him uh you, you seem to have a pretty good life how does what happened to you many years ago as a teenager how does that affect you today um I'm not going to lie to you. It's it's a fight. Um, it's been 24 years, and I do. On the outside, people would think I have it together, and and in a lot of we have so many facets to us. In a lot of ways, I am together, but then there's a part of me that does have the low self esteem, that does have insomnia, that does suffer from depression. A lot of have, people don't even see that, you know. Do you still have uh, nightmares about this place? I do. I've had nightmares about this place where I'm back in behind the gate and I'm trying to get away and trying to get away and I can't get away. And how do you deal with your parents today? Um, I don't I don't speak with I did I don't have a relationship with them. Um I don't blame you. I've tried um, three years after. I didn't speak to them for three years. I left home at 17. For three years, I didn't speak to them. And then, you know, I I, I went back. You know, something happened in my life where someone close to me passed away, and I wanted to make everything right. And and, and I went went back to them, and I tried the the relationship thing. But they still continue, you know, I want to say the Jerry Springer behavior and you can either choose to be in a Springer show or you can choose. Luckily, <laughs> as an adult, you have that choice to walk away. Exactly. The choice you didn't have as a teenager. By the way, how'd you get out of this place? Um, I, this is what I believe happened. And then my parents told me something different. Um, my parents said when they picked me up, well, this is Easter and it's a time for forgiveness. And we forgive you. And that's why we're taking you out. <laughs> the prodigal daughter returns yeah if you know anything about the prodigal son that's not a very good analogy yeah. first of all you kidnapped me you right. didn't give me any money right and and and, and, uh, and i was wondering wrong analogy so, so what, what, what do you really think happened um what i think happened is you know i was at a private christian school and some of the girls that were there got placed into this the private christian school and um they must have said what was going on with this place. And I think that... Um, the authorities came in and, and, and shut this place ba- down. Ba- basically, they were they were sp- spreading the rumor, which was true rumors about this place. And mm. it got probably got back to my mother. And they probably thought, what are you doing with your... Why is your daughter in the reform school? Because no one knew where I was. I mean, right. it was a kidnapping. So they were embarrassed by what they did. Right. Done. Why is this 3.5 grade point average in a reform school? So she probably got a bad reputation and then got me out early. Janine, um, you walked with us uh, at the rally, uh, and, uh, uh, and and it's amazing to me for someone who says they have stage fright and is, is afraid. Um, you told me at the rally yesterday that you weren't intending to speak, and then some brave people got up and told their stories, and then uh, you came to tell your story. I remember you didn't want to stand on the podium. I kind of made you do that. <laughs> so I said, nope, the camera can't I'll see you. I'll take the stairs, If thanks. you're not on the podium. <laughs> 
how does it feel for someone who by your own description is 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 is, is somewhat shy and has somewhat stage fright to now go public with your story. How does that feel to you? Is it scary? Is it empowering? Is it both? It's it's empowering and I will do whatever it takes to get the word out. And even if it has if I have to climb over this obstacle of being stage fright, I will do that. I will do whatever it takes to make to make it known that this is what's going on in America today. This is what's happening. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to let this happen? Allow this to happen? I'm sorry, but I don't know any reform schools or teenage programs so far that have been great and fantastic. I don't either. And I'm and anyone who says they are, and you've got a bunch of girls, fifty of them in the same place, but one of them is saying different. You need to realize that there is something called brainwashing, and it is like a cult. And after a while, you start believing these people and. Did you communicate with your parents during those eight months? Um, I had no other recourse. If it was my choice, I wouldn't have. Right. But yeah. did you write letters to them? I had to. And twice a week. And I couldn't write anybody else, by the way. Only Nobody. Your parents. I had more rights in jail. I, I should have been in jail. When you wrote your parents, could you tell them the truth? No. What even if I, even if if you, I did, we're talking about my parents here. Right. You that's know. true. You if didn't I, have if, very Let's right. just say I had normal right. parents. Right. right normal parents that believed me i couldn't say please help me um they were straight me, me. they duct taped a girl they handcuffed her they uh, yeah threw, they, no if i had normal parents if i did that they read every single thing that was going on i couldn't make a phone call i couldn't dial 911 i couldn't call my boyfriend please get me out of here please get your parents to get me out of here nothing i was trapped trapped and this is what i'm trying to bring the focus on it's amazing to me as most of us again would if it, you know uh, we we would treat a child better than an adult, and yet in America you have legal rights as an adult and not as a child. And if you happen to have horrible parents, as I'm sorry you did, Janine, that's not Janine's fault. You can't help where you're born. Uh, you can be completely abused. You, it's, it always strikes me that if a parent abuses a child, you know, if a, if a parent were to duct tape a child and handcuff her to a chair or make her stand all day, you call Child Protective Services, they would come in, they throw that parent in jail, but the parent can pay someone to do that, and suddenly it's okay? It doesn't make right. any sense. It Janine, doesn't. Thank you so much for your bravery, for sharing this story, for being courageous enough to come on thank the radio. Thank you so much for having me here, and, and I, I love you for doing this oh, for us. Thank, thank you, you so Janine. much. I appreciate that so much. I got my earphones on. So <laughs> in fact, I should probably take them off. <laughs> Folks, if you want to call in and join this discussion, I encourage you to do so. We're going to have a testimony from survivors for the whole next two hours. Many have similar stories from Janine. Some things are a little bit different, but the same theme is the same. Helpless kids who've done nothing wrong, being tortured and abused. Why does this go on in America and what we can do to stop it? There's actually a bill in Congress to stop it. I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes, too. If you want to call in, 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine and the Inside Scoop. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you so much. That was so What I'm thinking about doing for Congress, just real quick, is probably having that meeting. You're listening to WPWC. Show this video. We have a bunch of letters. We act radio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine talking about survivors of institutional abuse. You may not even know this is a problem in America. Uh, if you heard Janine's story, you cannot help but be moved by it. And I wish I could say that it was an anomaly, that what happened to Janine is just one example of awful parents sending one girl to one awful place. I wish I could say that it's not true. The next two uh, ladies you're going to hear from were in a place called Straight that existed way back in the, what, 80s, I guess it was? Early 80s. Early, early 1980s. This 80s. is not something new. This has been going on for a long time. I'm going to ask you both your stories. So uh, I got Dina here and Leslie here. I start with Leslie. Is that the rule here? All right. Okay. <laughs> so let me take my headphones off since we're not playing the music. And I'm, I'm going to start with you, Leslie. So now you were not in Straight, but your brother was. Correct. And why was your brother sent to Straight? Um, it certainly wasn't because he had a drug problem. 
Back. Strait is ostensibly, by the way, a drug treatment specific s- uh, center, right? Uh, unlike the um, Janine was in a, a Christian academy, this was supposedly something to help get kids off drugs. Right, it was specific to drugs. Ta- talking to the mic a little bit more. It was specific to drugs and people that abuse drugs. Although I would say, ninety-eight percent of the people in there, children in there, did did not have a drug problem, including your brother. Right. So why was your brother put there? Well, back in the early 80s with the Nancy Reagan, just say no mm-hmm. whole thing, um, if if your child was surly or your teenager was doing poorly in school or was belligerent to you or didn't follow the rules. I don't know a teenage kid that doesn't <laughs> talk back to their parents. Exactly. Exactly. But back then, the big buzzword was druggy behavior. Your child, if you could not, quote unquote, control your child, they were a druggie. So you're brother talked back a bit to his parents and was put in straight for how long was he there total the mic a little bit more a total of uh not quite three years over two and a half years two and a half years over two and a half what are some of the things that would happen to him at straight um he was starved he was starved denied food absolutely just just they didn't feed him they didn't feed him or if they did feed him they had uh what they referred to as peanut butter diets it was a punishment and you would get peanut butter diets um, and a Dixie cup of water three times a day. You would have to eat only peanut butter. Three times a day. And a single Dixie cup of water. You know, peanut butter makes you thirsty. Thick peanut butter. And this is just to torture him, I guess. It's punishment. It's punishment. Not torture. It's Excuse punishment. me. Excuse me. <laughs> punishment. Right. For not complying with the Whatever. program. And what are some of the things they would do in the program that he might not have complied with? Um, he didn't sit up straight. Um, He wrote his moral inventories incorrectly, which is something that they had to do every night. We all had to do. Siblings had to do it. Now, now this is interesting to me. You're a sibling. You're not in the program. Why do you have to do anything? Well, actually, um, as far as Straight Incorporated, uh, the entire family uh, was the entire family cell. Parents, step-parents, children, sibling, everybody was involved in some way or another. That's how they kept the whole cult-like... Uh, process moving along because they involved everyone so everyone was a part of the brainwashing and their movement to make the United States drug free I see so you actually had to do things yourself Um, and I'm gonna get to Dina's story in just a second but your brother was there after two and a half years he finally got out how did did he get out Um, this was not long after a very brave young man named Fred Collins sued straight for kidnapping he was 18 he said I have rights he escaped and he sued them and um, there were questions you know uh, so not all of the parents were completely brainwashed and one morning my brother spoke to my parents told them some of the smaller abuses because I think he knew if he told them about arms being broken and heads being smashed on the floor and stuff that they wouldn't believe him because it was the extreme and my parents immediately pulled him from the program after two and a half years mm. and then um, your brother got out of the program but apparently mm. the demons of the program continued to haunt him the damage was done at that point um, what he had I guess post-traumatic stress syndrome would be a way of characterizing it. he did but you know hindsight uh, because back in the early 80s It hasn't been till recently that bipolar and depression and all these newer buzzwords, and I don't mean that in a bad way. Right. People understand Um, more about these these, uh, these These afflictions. And and back then, there there was nothing like that. And if your child was a problem child, they were a druggie. So um, I think along with absolutely um, complex PTSD, uh, and I think my brother was bipolar, and I absolutely know that he suffered from depression, hindsight, all of that took its toll on him and um, not quite a year after my parents pulled him from the program he killed himself one of the things that we did at the convention was read a name of uh, of documented cases of more than 300 kids who have been killed by these programs some within this program some from suicide after Um, your brother's story while it needs to be told is unfortunately not an isolated one no, I have to say, because I read the names of um, people from straight that have um, passed away, and I was shocked. I had three typed pages of names, and um, 
out of all three pages of names, there was one person that died from cancer. There was another person that died from an overdose. The rest were all suicide. On my page, they all died from some of the restraints they used, uh, forcible restraints where uh, uh, well, actually, I'm going to ask Dina, I'm going to ask you about some of that because you, you were in straight yourself, right? Yes, yes. And how, how long were you in straight? Um, about between two and three months. So that's not that very long considering, no. I mean, no. uh, uh, Leslie's been there for three Absolutely years. Absolutely not. Uh, and, and why were you sent to straight? Um, my mom tricked me into going there. Um, I'm really quite not sure of the backstory because we still don't speak. No, um, that's very interesting. This mm-hmm. has been many, many years, obviously yes. since the early 80s, and you don't speak to your mom, no. all because she incarcerated you for two months against your will Yes, and in the hellhole called straight. Yes, and it was very hypocritical of her because I was not doing drugs, and she was. And she was? She was. Wow. So what did you see at straight? Tell me about some of those restraints. Um, it happened constantly. We were in a room at least at any given time with... I'd say 400 kids is what it seemed like. Um, How old were you at the time? 15. I went in at 15, came out at 16. I turned 16 in there. Um, And constantly, I guess from the constant stress, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at any time to get a scream out or anything. And this would, until that person calmed down, which when you're filled with that much rage and frustration could be hours. And you still couldn't even, like, you you hear it going on, but everyone's still made to face forward as if this isn't going on next to you. But it was constantly. Um, one of the things that, the extraordinary weird stuff that goes on in places like this, one of the extraordinary things is in order to get their attention in a regular school setting, you raise your hand, I'd like to speak. Uh, it's hard to demonstrate in these confined quarters of radio station. I'm going to stand back. Mm-hmm. Uh, but can you show us what you had to do? Not as, as dramatically, perhaps. Is that, is that, would that be terrible to show what they what they made you do? As far as motivating? Yeah, as far uh, as motivating. I couldn't do that. It literally, like... It would drive you crazy. It, no, it would make me want to throw up. All right. Okay. Um, but I would I'll, like I'll to mention something it, about then. the hand, if I could. Like, yeah. it had to be, you know, and my timeline within there is completely screwed up, and I remember very little, but... One specific thing I remember is um, being a female, getting my normal cycle in there. I remember raising my hand because you had to, like, put your hand up like a flag to use the bathroom because we only got two bathroom breaks a day. And it being slammed down constantly, like, within, you know, every time I put it up, it would get slammed down. I keep putting it up because I had to go to the restroom, and I was made to sit in that chair all day in my mess. Um, Yeah. I don't want to cause you any emotional stress, so I'll, I'll do this on camera after, maybe after you leave the radio station. I'll show them what, uh, quote, motivating was. It's basically flailing your arms pretty wildly yeah. and wildly in, in ways that are, are And you're, are really if you don't do it, they're, like, forcing you to do it. Like, people physically take your arms to force you. And there was a lot of physical... Constant physical force. Physical force. Mm-hmm. And, and no escape. No. You're very brave to tell this story, and I really do appreciate it. I really appreciate you coming on and telling the story. Thank you. Um, let me go back to Leslie here. Um, you, as a sibling, were um, made to attend, I guess, what you call meetings, house family meetings? What do you call them? Well, the siblings had to go to two separate kind of meetings. We had our own sibling meetings or raps, talks. Talks. But you're not even in the program. Correct. How do they make you go? Your parents made you go? Oh, there was no choice. There was no choice. No, explain that to me because people, you have to understand, Leslie, people who, who don't know of these programs right. don't understand how right. there couldn't be a choice. So you got to explain how there wasn't a choice. Um, if I didn't, if I skipped a meeting, yeah, a siblings meeting, right, what or happens? I skipped um, and I went to the next one, uh-huh. I was stood up as if I was in the program. Um, we called it, the siblings call it the big room. We were mm-hmm. the siblings and then there was the parents. Then there was the big group, mm-hmm. which is what my brother was in. It's what Dina was in. Mm-hmm. And um, if um, if you missed meetings, sibling meetings, you could end up in the program. Wow. Because that's irresponsibility and that's druggy behavior. Druggy behavior to miss a single meeting. Mm-hmm. Now, your parents obviously acquiesced at least, if not actively supported, 
this kind of program. One of the things that you were telling me is that when you were, your last time you marched in Washington, before the yesterday. The only time I've ever marched. The only marched. time you've ever marched in Washington, before yesterday, when you marched with the group to stop institutional abuse, you actually marched with a sign at age 13 to support straight. It was 30 years ago, almost 31, but it was 30 years ago, and um, that same brave young man I was talking about, Fred Collins, when he was suing straight, they were, and it was at the federal level, uh, they were at the federal courthouse in Alexandria, and we, we, straight, we were out front protesting the lawsuit, and I was 13, little towhead, and I had a big old sign that said straight was great, and we were all walking around with our straight is great. Did Science. you think straight was great when you were 13? I thought whatever I was told to think. I was 13. I so your parents told you, hey, carry this sign and march. My parents, my friends, my brother. It's a whole cult. There's a whole, whole group of people involved in this. Yes, absolutely. One of the things that I want to point out is I actually began studying this issue back in 2005 with straight was actually the particular uh, residential um, prison camp slash uh, 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 I hate to call it a treatment center because the only treating they did was violent facility. torture facility, a torture camp. Um, I began because the founder of Straight, a guy by the name of Mel Sembler, was actually our ambassador to Italy and to Australia under George W. Bush. He gave a lot of money to George W. Bush. He got a lot of accolades from President Bush. And he actually has been running Mitt Romney's campaign as well, giving a lot of money to Mitt Romney these are powerful people, and they have powerful friends. And I think that's why they get away with torturing children. And I just want to let people know that one of the things that I am very concerned about, and I know everyone in this community is, is legislation to stop child abuse. And to stop, because people say, well, how could this happen? How could The answer is very powerful people got paid a lot of money. Your parents, they, they pay money for this place? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about how much, but it was a lot of money. Probably my brother's college tuition, my college tuition, and if they had two other children, their college tuition. All to have you be tortured, restrained. All to lose my brother. And, of course, your brother lost his life. And the and the family broke apart. My parents got divorced, and, you know, and, and, there, was, and then there was me in the background. So, yeah, all yeah. for that. Yay. <laughs> It's evil. You know, Leslie can laugh about it because she's a grown-up and because it was 30 years ago and because sometimes you laugh rather than crying. But uh, there's a bill by Congressman George Miller. It's called the Stop Abuse in Residential Treatment Centers Act. It passed the House in 2009 when the Democrats were in charge. The Republicans filibustered it in the Senate because they were against needless regulation. I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, torturing children is not something that is needless to stop. It is essential to stop in the United States of America. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this program is to encourage you to call your member of Congress wherever you live. You can pick up the phone and dial 202-225-3121. That's the Capitol switchboard. Do it on Monday. And tell your member of Congress, tell your senator, tell your, uh, your representative Hey, did you know that children are being tortured and abused in America legally? That they're doing it in facilities? That parents who couldn't legally abuse their children can outsource it? That powerful political figures are allowing this to happen? And ask simply that it be regulated. I'd like to ban these facilities, but we can start at least with regulation. This is Mark Levine. We're going to bring on some more survivors in just a few minutes. If you want to dial in, it's 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. I want to thank both Dina and Leslie for being courageous enough to tell your stories. I really do appreciate it. And uh, I know I'll see you both again at the next uh, convention. Yep. Thank you for having thank you. us. Thank you very much for coming in. We'll be right back with more of the Inside Scoop right after this. listening to WPWC We Act Radio 1480 AM 
Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine talking to survivors of institutional abuse. Rhonda, um, you and I met, I guess, at the SIA convention uh, last year. Yep. And uh, I, it's funny, I've gotten to know so many of you, and you're all such wonderful, strong people, particularly after undergoing what you've been through. It's amazing to me, is because your stories are so strong and so real and so powerful. We're going to get to yours in just a second. But you have an ordinary life. You, you have a, I mean, I won't have to go into all the details, but the ordinary job and family and all. And yet you've got this thing in the back of your head that happened to you years ago. Is that a little weird, disconcerting to go back and forth between your real life and, and what happened all those years ago? Kind of, but now I, I, a lot of people around me are aware of what happened to me. And so um, it helps for me to talk about it I, I, it's so my life now, all of this is my life, that it's now my friends. It's bringing awareness. So actually integrating it all in together is is made me more of a whole as a person. Talking it, about it actually makes it easier. Yeah, in, instead of trying to live one life that nobody knows about and all of these things that go on in my head that no one knows and then try to be a mom and a wife and right. a friend. and. So let's talk about it. Uh, where were you placed? New Bethany Home for Girls, Arcadia, Louisiana. And how long were you there? I was there one year. Just one year. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, one year can be traumatizing. We just heard from Dina. She was in straight for only, only I should say, two, three months. And yet that three months clearly has traumatized her to this day. Uh, you were there a year. Um, tell us what's life like? What's an ordinary day like in New Bethany Home for Girls? Well, um, you wake up in the morning and you do roll call. And we all file into a line and they go down the list to make sure that every girl is still there. And then we would go to what was called morning devotions where we would still be in our pajamas and sit down and have a little church session in the morning. Then you would get ready and go to breakfast. When you cross, the, you were two by two everywhere you went and um, we would cross the street and line into the gym and then um, whoever was the staff person crossing us would call out a scripture, and then we would all be made to recite the scripture. It, it was almost like a chant. It, that's one of the deepest um, core memories is the chanting of the scripture that has stayed with me so long. Then you'd go in and eat. You'd go to school. You'd if you you would go work in the fields. Working in the fields, what does that mean? We would, um, they would take a certain amount of us out and we would pick potatoes, we would pick shuck corn, anything, you know, he would plow the fields, but we had to plan them. We had to... Who's he? Mac Ford. He's Who's the Mac owner Ford? of New Bethany Home for Girls. So you were basically picking tomatoes in his private garden? His, yes. That he, I guess, sold on the market? like. <laughs> yes, and then we were required to wear dresses and so we were in the fields in dresses, and the ants would crawl oh my God. clear, and they would blister your body. Why couldn't you wear jeans? Um, a woman is not to wear anything that pertains to a man. I see. And so we were, we were, we had our shirts could only be three fingers from our collarbone. Anything that we might do, like if your skirt went up above your knee for a second something you were doing something sexual towards one of the male um workers there yes and and um the big thing was that they really used eve to um what happened with adam and eve in the apple uh -huh. the temptress the, yes the temptress and so we became in in the eyes of at least Mac Ford and his staff, we were um, the epitome of Eve, and it was you're, you're, our. How old are you here? I'm 15. You're 15. But there's old much girl. younger girls than me. And and you're tempting some guy. Mm -hmm. Just by you're, you're, because you're, your skirt has because slipped up. Because you have ants on your on your legs and you and your skirt's lifted up a little bit. So how would you be punished if? your skirt got above your knee or you were otherwise tempting a man in a way Mac Ford didn't like. How, how, how did they punish you? There were all different forms of punishment. Um, you would get either beat with the paddle. I got 
um, 86 swats with the paddle. 86 in one? Two weeks before I left because I thought it would be funny. I took the song Hotel California and I rewrote it. I like to write twisted tunes. Mm -hmm. And I rewrote it, Welcome to New Bethany, Home for Girls. And it's very ironic that at the end of that you song... You can check out any you like, but you, you can, can never, never leave. leave. And that's my whole life. That has been so real to me. I don't know why I picked that song. I don't know. But they found it when they, when they would do room search. And they found the letter. And so in Morning Devotions, Miss Nora... It's a letter? It was, it was like a... Um, so you just wrote something down. I just down. wrote it, yeah. Just like for yourself. It, mm -hmm. wasn't, it wasn't like you were playing on the PA system, Hotel California. Right. You just wrote down a little note about New Bethany. Mm -hmm. You check any time you can like, but you can never leave, which happened to be true. Mm -hmm. And just for writing this little note to yourself, they found it, and then what did they do? They read it in front of everybody first, and some girls were in there, um, Miss Nora, that's not a poem. Which I always wondered how they knew all the lyrics to these songs. <laughs> they lived uh, in the outside uh, world, uh, yeah. like you. Well, um, so then I ended up getting 86 swats, and you have to lift up your skirt, and so your slip is showing, and bend over and grab the chair and hold on to the chair. And Miss Norma, Nora was a very large, large woman, and she would take the paddle and lean it so it would touch her shoulder over here before she would swing it down. So she could get maximum. And you could feel the wind coming as the paddle was coming through the air. And if you let go of the chair, she started over. She started over. And so as a 15-year-old girl who is being beaten by this 300-plus pound woman, I can't help but to let go of the chair. I'm almost to... You swatted away. Yeah, I'm almost to hit the ground. And it was... Um, that was probably my worst day at New Bethany was that, but I knew that I was going home. So I was How'd just you know like, going home? because, um, some girls were only put there one year to one year and, um, and then your parents had to re-sign you again, but legally they had kept me against my will for three months. And I didn't know until I got home that in the state of Louisiana, 17 years old, you're a legal adult. And I had turned 17 in March, but they kept me till June. So legally, it and was... why did your parents put you there to begin with? Well, um, I was attempting suicide a lot. I had been raped by three of my friend's brothers. And then instead of getting help, I was just moved to another family member's house. But my stepfather had also been grooming me since I was four years old. And been grooming you? Yes, to be a wife. Since you were four? From the time I was four till I was 14. Your he, stepfather? Mm hmm He was telling you he was going to make you his wife? No, he was showing me how to be a wife. Sexually? Sexually. And so when all that came out, I had gotten raped by the three neighbor boys also, and... So I got packed up and moved to my aunt and uncle's house, and I started attempting suicide. I was... I don't blame you. I, I just wanted out. Sure. And my mother called me on the phone and said that she wanted to take me to Disneyland so that we could bond. Oh, no. And she took How me horrible. to New Bethany and left me there. How horrible. Disneyland's every kid's favorite thing, and... Yeah. That's really cruel. So how have you dealt with your parents afterwards? Um, actually, I, I would have to say that um, I felt like I had... St now I know what Stockholm is. Stockholm Syndrome. But That's when a hostage uh, feels like they have to protect or support their captors. Exactly. And um, I think for the last 30-some years, I I acted as if my stepfather never did anything to me. I protected my siblings. I I just went about life as if um, that didn't happen. And I was really in denial of a lot of things. And it wasn't until I found the New Bethany survivors that I ever actually, I had stifled who I was. And when when I met my friends and, and began to be able to talk about it, that's when I started growing. And New Bethany survivors is what? Um, 
It's a lot of the girls that have been t- through New Bethany for the last four decades. You connected via the internet? Yes, via Facebook. We have a, we had, we're actually in the process of moving it right now, but we've had a website up for the last 10, 12 years. 2005. So you, when did you leave New Bethany? What? 1982, June 82. of 82. So for 20 years after you left New Bethany. 30. 30. You never really focused on what your parents had done, the horrors that had been done to you by your stepfather, by the neighbor boys, at this place, at New Bethany. Were you sexually harmed in New Bethany? I believe so, but I believe that... It's hard to remember after all the trauma, I'm sure. Exactly, and I can... I, I visualize what happened, and another friend of mine has confirmed that, yes, he did take you in that room a lot, mm. But as to the actual, I've blocked that, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and so at New Bethany, you talked about the New Bethany girls, New Bethany survivors, it helped you finally heal after 20 years, 30 years of pain. But could you, did you bond within New Bethany with these girls? Were you allowed to look at them, hug them, well, and take care of them? No. No, was the contact was not really. Um, if you if you created a friend, um, you were automatically separated and put on either sides of the room. Friendship was against the rules. Yeah, it, they they called it cliques. Wow. And we couldn't be in cliques, and and you could talk to each other, but you couldn't. Like I I could have never known what Simone's background was. And Simone was there when you were there. Yep, Simone is there with me. Um, and you described something you told me about. Simone was four years younger than you, and they did something to her. Tell, tell that story. Well, I think it would be better if Simone told that story, right. actually. I'll tell you what. Why don't I thank you, Rhonda, very much for telling me what you have to tell me, and why don't you switch seats with Simone and okay. let me interview her for a bit. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thank you, Rhonda. I, I am always struck by the bravery, the courage. Well, listen. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine talking with survivors of institutional abuse. If you want to call in, it's 202-889-9797. I had a number of different powerful stories in the studio. I understand we've got Mike uh, Michael from the Bronx on the line. What do you think of these stories? Pretty, pretty powerful stuff, huh? Powerful. My heart is melting and crying for these young ladies. I hope they can hear me. Can they hear me? Uh, many of them can. Not sure all of them can, but uh, they'll be able to hear it on the archive later on. Very well. Um, from what I am hearing, first off, it makes me so mad that these institutions, instead of helping these young ladies out that were troubled from earlier incidents, they broaden or widen the injustice further by, and I'm going to use the legal terms, the assault on them, the abuse, right. the violence, right. the basic federal civil rights violations that have been going on. I got to hand it to you, ladies. You are all so doggone brave to be speaking with Mark and telling your stories on the air. And I encourage you that you go national on this. This is why these southern states, these red states, are so freaking screwed up in the heads. And they have, they got the gall to want to talk about being patriotic, got the gall to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance, saying liberty and justice I'll, t- I'll tell you, Michael, it, it, it's true, uh-huh. and, and we're going to actually have a, a, a young woman come on and talk about what Alabama did to her, and this, right. these occurred in I, Louisiana. I, but I, I do have to say, some of yeah. these camps, they're in Maine, they're in New Jersey, they're in Utah. A lot of them are in the South. You're absolutely right about that, but not all of them. Not all, all right. of them. The, the first okay. woman, Janine, was in California. So right, this right. is a nationwide problem. Again, I agree it's it's more in the South than elsewhere, and I'm not defending the South. But you have to understand yeah. this is not only the South. This is a nationwide problem. I understand. Problem. I, I understand, and thank you for clarifying that. The fact of the matter is I think this is a matter that needs to be referred to Attorney General Eric Holder's office. We have a widespread um, systemic pattern of federal civil rights violations and clear um, case of physical, even sexual abuses. Right. And the reason why I know this, I know about this, I can empathize with these ladies, is because we've had the same crap 
going on here in New York City with cases with the NYPD. And I get so fed up with the subsequent cover-ups that are going on within these institutions. That is also obstruction of truth and justice in my book. So, yes, ladies, I encourage you. Huh? Uh, let, me, let me tell you something, Michael, and we're going to talk a little bit about this a little bit on the broadcast. There, we have been trying, uh, at least since 2009, to pass legislation to regulate these places because they're unlicensed. Regulators don't come in. Many of them are private. Some of them assert it's a religious right to do what they do, and inspectors don't come in. Sometimes they're shut down. They're opened under in another state. The same guy, this guy, Mac Ford, has had like three of these places. Uh, and so one of the ways to regulate them, the best way, is Congress to pass federal legislation. There's actually a bill by Congressman George Miller of California. It's called the Stop Abuse and Residential Treatment Act. It was passed by the Democratic House in 2009. The Republicans won't pass it. But uh, interesting. So they true colors. Well, I'll tell you this. Interesting thing about that bill. Uh, every Democrat save one voted for it. Some 230 Democrats voted for it. But 40 percent plus of Republicans voted for it too. So even not quite the majority, but even a substantial number, almost half the Republicans also felt, you know what? Torture, abuse of children, this is a bad thing. We need to regulate this. So I think it's this kind of legislation that, that we can actually get passed. I want to get back to my other survivors, but I'll tell you what you could do to help, Michael. If you'll help publicize this, and mm -hmm. you'll call your member of Congress and make sure they support this act, we can help stop these awful places, because there's thousands of kids in these places today who are being mistreated today. And Absolutely. by the way, it's not just, it's not just women. There's a, a filmmaker by the name of Nick Gallia. Uh, you can find out his film at N-I-C-K-G-A-G-L-I-A.com. He was mistreated in a, a camp uh, much like Straight that you heard about in New Jersey. And he describes his uh, what happened to him in a movie. Aaron Bacon, uh, a young kid, was uh, murdered in Utah uh, uh, by by wilderness camp. So you're absolutely right about the strength of these women these uh, here. But this actually is something that occurs to boys and girls and also and occurs in the North South North and North outside the South. And actually, there are three camps I know about outside the United States, one in Mexico, one in uh, Jamaica, and one in American Samoa, where kids in, in Mexico, I met a young woman at this convention. She was placed in a, a, a dog cage and forced right. in Mexico to live in a dog cage. That's the kind of torture and as abuse, as and as almost as none as of these people are punished. Almost never are they punished. Can I mention one more thing Real before quick, I depart? Yeah. All right. Um, first, first off, we had um, daycare centers here in New York City that was shut down for that abuse also, so it could happen elsewhere. And furthermore, ladies and everyone that's listening, anybody that's going to say it's our religious right to do these actions, do not believe that for a moment. There is nothing. Absolutely nothing in Scripture that permits abuse of another human being, especially these Christian, right-wing Christian fanatics and want to state that kind of farce and lie. You're talking to a Christian. You're talking to a Catholic right here. I just want to set the record straight and keep it real for everyone so you all may be aware of your rights and your surroundings. There is nothing that advocates this kind of injustice. In fact, Jesus himself said to love one another and go about peace. This is totally contradicting to what the uh, um, Scripture says under the Gospel of Jesus. Couldn't agree with you more, Michael, and I really appreciate your call. Thank you, guys. Thank you Good for luck, calling. ladies. Thank you. And, of course, Michael demonstrates the passion that I want everyone who hears this show to, to feel. Uh, Michael, like me, is not a survivor of these places, but he's angered, quite rightly, by what's going on and if this story is new to you if you think this sounds a little weird or over the top and it is weird and it is over the top you can check out other shows i've done on this topic go to marklivingtalk.com look up uh, go to my archive and look for teen or or abuse and you'll find i've done a number of shows you can hear from dozens of victims it's not just the ones i'm bringing here today uh, you can also check out nigalia's film uh, the uh, over the gw or aaron bacon Check it out. Find it out. This is actually going on in America. And next time you hear someone talk about a boot camp or a scared straight or wilderness camp or a troubled teen or a residential drug treatment center, here, here's what you do. If they're not allowed to communicate freely, that place is a prison camp. If they're not allowed to leave of their own free will, that place is likely to be abused, to have kids that are abused. Because remember, if you're not allowed to leave, you're not allowed to call anyone 
They can monitor everything that goes in and out. We've got to stop and regulate these places. Okay, Simone, uh, you've been sitting here uh, next to me for for a bit, and I want to get right to your story. Um, as horrible as the – and uh, I did, we don't do pain-offs here, but as horrible as the stories we've just heard of Janine and Rhonda and Leslie and, I mean, and, and Dina, your story <laughs> – it's, it's pretty damn awful. Um, you you never really had parents. No. Uh, speak, speak into the microphone. No. You you, you, no. Were, you grew up in like, foster homes and. Uh, um, I I had, I had parents that had adopted me, but it was not. Um, it just was not a good, a good match. Okay, and they sent you to New Bethany Home for Girls. I'm not sure exactly how I ended up at New Bethany. Um, I. I just ended up there. And how old were you when you got there? I was 13. 13 years old. And how long were you there? Until I was 16 and a half. So three and a half years. Now, that's longer than most of the of the women we've heard. Three and a half years. Describe some of the things you saw at New Bethany. Uh, you probably don't know where to begin. I, yeah, I don't, I don't know where to begin. Um, it, it just daily um, terror. Just um, terror daily. Physically... Uh, physically, sexually, emotionally, spiritually. Well, let's let's go through them. Sorry, but uh, um, um, physically, what would they do? The physical abuse was was horrific. Um, there, they would the the licks they called the the paddlings. They were licks, um, and I I can remember many different times receiving licks. Um, and and Nora Carter, the house mother, um, Claire Shipman, the other another woman that worked in there they would hit they would hit me so hard that well like Rhonda had said you can you can feel the air from the paddle but also I can remember hearing them actually grunting like they were just trying to use as much strength as they could to break me what what I mean it's hard to imagine someone being so cruel uh, again, I don't doubt your word in the least, but what was this woman's motivation? Do you have any idea? I, I have absolutely no idea. She's just idea. a mean, I, sadistic person? Spare yes. Yeah? Spare yeah. the rod, spoil the child, Rhonda just said. It so. was on the bridge. Oh, it was on, it was on the bridge. There was a scripture on the bridge that said um, something about sparing the rod and spoiling the child. And so they thought they were doing good by mm-hmm. beating the heck they, out of you. They thought that they were going to break me. Um, and, and I, I, I'm still broken, um, now, but while I was there, I did not allow them to see that they were breaking me. I did not lo- allow them to see, um, I didn't show any emotion. That must have taken tremendous fortitude and courage. I mean, that's very, very hard to do. A guy's, a, a woman is beating you senseless mm-hmm. and you're still not sure. So you're not crying. I did not cry. In the three and a half years you were there? Once. One time. Mm-hmm. In all three and a half years. Mm-hmm. What happened that one time? Um, I had received a very bad beating. Um, and I was walking down Whitehall, and I, I just had a... They had Whitehall and Greenhall in, in different places there. Um, and I uh, leaned up against the wall, and I just kind of fell to the floor and, and lost it. And... Uh, cried I, I just cried I, I just knew that this is where I was going to be until I was 18 years old um, and you were all alone in the hallway a, a couple of girls you know were walking but um, no one you couldn't no, staff. no you and, and you couldn't no one would could stop and ask if I was okay or and that just was not allowed at New Bethany but I understand uh, one young girl Namely, the person standing next to you, Rhonda. Rhonda. She did. She did. Even she though it was against the rules. She leaned down and she put her arms around me, and said into my ear to stay strong. And I remembered that for the whole rest of the time that I was there. And that made you strong, just those words mm-hmm. that this very kind person next to you did, risking her own safety to mm-hmm. to say. What would happen if Rhonda had been caught hugging you, saying, stay strong? We would have been accused of being lesbians. Oh, 
God. We would have been thrown into a cold shower and scrubbed with Comet and Green Scratchers. With what? Comet and Green Scratchers. Like a, a, a very... Um, to like scrape, pad. like a brillo pad, like to they, scrape the filth off of us, so that you would get bloody, and then the comet would would clean us. Clean us. Yes. Did that ever happen to you? I was scrubbed with brillo pads. Yes, with green scratchers. I I was accused of. I had gotten into the shower, and when you got into the shower, it was when it was your turn. You get in. You have three minutes, and you get out. And I forgot my washcloth. And I was accused of masturbating. And they scrubbed you with the... They did, uh, with Comet eyes. and Green Scratchers. You mentioned sexual abuse. If you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about that. Um, it, I was raped. Okay. It, it was not... Um, I, I think sexual abuse is... is too light. Too light. I was, right. I was viciously raped. Viciously raped. Viciously. More yes. than once. Many times. I, I can't even count how many times. By? By uh, the principal of the school. Macford. Um No. 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 Uh, another mm -hmm. person who worked for him. Yes. Mac Macford also abused me, but, but this was a different person. And you didn't feel that you could say that you had been raped? No. Be no, it, it, it's within the faith-based community, um, and, I, and I, I use that form for them lightly as well because I do not believe that they were any type of faith. Right. But the men were the highest power. Um, and if a man felt sexual feelings towards a child, um, he would act upon those sexual feelings. And if, if that man was married his wife would beat you for tempting her husband. So the husband would rape you, and then the wife would beat you because you tempted her husband. Yes. Wow, that's sick. Very. Now, why? I'm sure my listeners are asking themselves, why aren't these people punished? Why isn't this guy in jail? I mean, rape, you can get a life sentence for rape, or at least 15 to 20 five years, why weren't these people at New Bethany prosecuted? I don't know. Did you report your crimes? I did. Did you report them to the police? I did. Did you ever manage to escape New Bethany? I did, yes. Tell me about that. I, I was I was a runner. I was, you know, I, I would, any time I had any type of chance to run, I would run. Um, I made it to town one time and went to the police department and I was um I had I had bruises and open wounds um scratches I mean I I, I was beat up and and I I had been raped and I told the the police department what had happened to me and they said well let's call your parents and you didn't um, have any parents Mac Mac Ford. I, I was left there. They they were. He he was my parent. <laughs> How was he your parent? How was this sick bastard your parent? Because he was also an orphanage. He was a children's home. Um, all of us were told. Even even the kids that had, um, maybe had just gotten into a a little bit of trouble and were sent there. There are many different reasons that girls were sent there. Um. Mac Ford told us that he was the closest thing to God that we would ever meet and that we belonged to him. He owned us. Well, but you tell the police that you've been beaten and raped and they can see it. This isn't a question of your word against his. No. The evidence is all over your body. Most definitely. I don't they take pictures of no. the abuse? No. no. They put me in the police car and they took me back. And they took you, the police took you the back police to New took Bethany. Me back to New Did they Bethany. tell you why? There wasn't anyone that would come get me or could come get me. Because you didn't have. Parents. I didn't have. He had power anybody. of attorney over all of us. So he was our legal guardian. He could do anything he wanted. Simone, um, I've known you now for about a year, and I have to say, you're one of the strongest people 
I've ever known. One of the things you should know about Simone is she's taking this horrific life experience and she's working every day as part of an organizer for an organization called HEAL. You can find out more about HEAL at H-E-A-L-Online.org. Simone, and I do a little bit, but Simone does most of it, helps rescue kids to the extent that we can who are in these awful places. And she's pretty much devoted her life. I mean, uh, she's got a family and kids and, and she's got a lot of stuff going on, but um, she's devoted her life to making sure that no young boy or girl ever suffer what you underwent. And I got to tell you, that's... Every time I hear your story, my heart breaks a little, but then it builds up three times stronger because I know what good you're doing and how committed you are to the cause. And you just got an award, actually. Uh, the highest award that the SIA organization gives, the Phoenix Award, for your work in helping children escape. And I just want to thank you personally and say I love you and I'm really glad that, that you do what you do. So, so, wow, that's emotional for me. probably is for you, too. We're going to take another break. Break. is Mark Levine in a really emotional end to what was for me an emotional weekend, uh, spending three days with Survivors of Institutional Abuse, and uh, I'm so grateful to all of them who are coming here on my radio show today. I, I really, you know, it's hard to convey, I think, the powerful emotion when you bring up these awful things that happen to these, to these wonderful people. They have to relive it to tell the story, and it's painful. And it's kind of hard for me because I know I'm asking people I care about to go through a little bit of pain, but we all understand, they understand and I understand, that it's only by sharing this pain with you in the hopes that you do something about it, in the hopes that you act about it, that we can stop the current ongoing abuse and torture and rape and mistreatment of teenage girls and boys all across America. So they are undergoing pain for you. And I'm going to ask that you call your member of Congress when I'm done with the Inside Scoop today at 202-225-3121. That's the capital switchboard. You can get any senator, any House, any representative and ask them whether they support torture and abuse of our teens in these residential treatment centers and these built wilderness camps and boot camps and so-called Christian facilities that don't seem very Christian to me. Just simply ask them if they know about it, because they probably don't, and if they're willing to support a bill to stop it. And if they don't know information about it, you can go to SIA, Survivors of Institutional Abuse. Uh, you can go to heal-online.org. There's a number of organizations. You can look them up on the web. If you have any doubt as to what these brave people are telling you, you can listen to a lot of testimony on my website, marklevingtalk.com. You can watch uh, some great movies by Nick Gallia, N-I-C-K-G-A-G-L-I-A.com, Over the W, Aaron Bacon. There's a new movie out by Vince Grashaw called Cold Water. Inform yourself, because this is going on in America, and it shouldn't be. So I just, the bravery of these people is amazing. And uh, I got another very, very brave person sitting next to me now. You, Teresa, I just met uh, a couple of days ago, actually. Indeed. Yes, we did. And, My uh, pleasure. Yeah. Well, you were not uh, with the SEA organization last year. You just, I guess, found out about it, what, a few months ago? I did. I did. Um, throughout the years that um, social media came out, um, we had an opportunity to uh, reconnect with people from our past, old family members and friends. And so I started thinking about some of the girls in the home that I knew and what names I could remember. I, I did look them up and try to find them. Now, you were, grew up in Alabama. Florida. Oh, Florida, excuse me. Yes. You grew up in Florida. Uh, you now live in Alabama. I live, I live in, in Ohio. Ohio. Right. I thought That's you said you Alabama so at some point. There are a lot of you. Um, you grew up in Florida, in that, that, that part of Florida that's the panhandle, that's sort of the southern part of, of Florida, uh, ironically, since it's the northern part, but it's the part that's most uh, fit, affiliated with the cultural south. And um, your parents put you in what place? I was um, left at a home called Charity Haven Girls Home uh, in Milton, Florida, right outside of Pensacola. And you said you were left there? 
I was left there. Yes. What, how did that happen? I was left in Milton, Florida at the girls' home after I was taken on a four-hour drive. Um, recommendation of the home that I was in, and child locks were put on the vehicle so that I could not get out. Um, my parent pulled me into the driveway and unloaded my case and uh, introduced me to the Mr. and Mrs. of the home and pulled off, and I did not know I was going to be left there. How old were you at the time? I was 15. Why would your parents drop you off at this place that you were locked into and then turn around and say goodbye. What, what 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 was going on? You know, that's a really good question. The reason that my mom, that I believe now, and I and I wish that I could say that she had the best intentions, but I had I was a survivor of a different kind of abuse at home, and my stepfather um, apparently liked little girls better than he liked my mom. And so um, after that had come out, uh, he was taken to prison, and I felt like maybe mom just couldn't look at me anymore. You were raped by your stepfather? I was uh, molested, molested for 10 years. Molested for 10 years by your stepfather. Mm -hmm. So he's sent to prison. Correct. For molesting you, his stepdaughter. Yes. And then your mom gets so upset that she sends you away. Yes. And Charity Haven, the home that I was sent away to, um, was not... The first place that I was sent, I've actually been in several different uh, mental hospitals and, and homes. Um, Charity Haven in particular um, is the one that I'm here to speak about because of the lack of oversight and the abuse that went on in the home. How ironic they call it Haven when it was anything but. Uh, tell me about some of the abuse that you saw there. Um, well, I mean, if I had a list, I tell you, uh, it, the list has been in my brain all of these years. And um, I, I, I know I can't give dates, but uh, there was a lot of abuse that went on in the home there. Um, in particular, um, girls were dragged into a closet and locked in. I, I also helped drag girls in. I was dragged into this closet. It had no doors or excuse me, no windows. It did have a locked door on it. Um, and a, a constant feed, a audio feed of preaching all the time. That was one of the things that was bothersome. Girls screaming and scratching and clawing for their lives are tacked down by their fellow peers and dragged into this prayer room, to the get right room, if you will. Um, That's what they called it, the get right room. It was called the prayer room. The prayer I've heard room. the get right room in other, in other okay. scenarios, but the prayer room in this case. And you'd sit there uh, locked in a small closet. Was, it, was there a light switch in the closet? There was a light switch, um, but there was no windows, and the closet uh, was very small. I want to say maybe like a 10 by 4 no, room. No chairs in there. Correct. No chairs, no furniture. You had your Bible. You sit on the floor. Sit on the floor. And you hear verses all day. Yeah. they would. What if you had to go to the bathroom? The door's locked. If you went to the bathroom, you had to wait for someone to hopefully come get you. And if they did, in a lot of cases, girls uh, would soil on themselves. Because they, they would, couldn't get out to go to the bathroom. They could not get out. What if you were hungry? If you were hungry, um, you were hungry. That's about it. Yeah, and 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 you you ser no matter how hungry you were, you were never allowed to ask. You were never allowed to mention it. Um, what would happen if you asked for food? How would you be punished? You said you were not allowed to, so you, so you break this rule. You say, I'm hungry, I want to eat. Maybe a new girl who doesn't know the rules. What would happen to such a person? I never saw anybody break that rule. Really? Meals were served at a certain time. Um, and so because of that, I've never saw anybody break that. Well, I can give you some general consequences okay. for any type of rule breaking. Right. Well, what, would be, what would be something you could break? Like look, looking at someone? Looking that, at someone would you, definitely be an offense that would earn you a demerit. Looking at someone, like looking them in the eyes? Yes. That's a demerit? Absolutely. Okay. How about hugging or showing compassion for someone? No what? physical contact no amongst physical the girls. No physical contact. So a girl is breaking down crying. If you help her feel a little bit better about herself, what would be some of the punishments? It would be misconstrued. If you were to help a child, and, and again, we were all children in this home. Sure. Um, it would be misconstrued as uh, being a, a, maybe a lesbian. Really? Or, uh, correct, yeah. Or maybe you were uh, co-conspiring with this person, and so they kept us very distant from one another 
um, as much as they could so that there was no co-conspiracies going on. Co-conspiracy. So basically, you were completely mistrusted the whole time. Completely mistrusted and discredited. And discredited. How would they discredit you? Well, you know, uh, discredit, discrediting the word itself um, is it, just, it doesn't even give it justice. Uh, when we go... Uh, you were called names. We were called names. We were whores and... and the B word. We're on the radio, so I'll try to be careful with with my language. Um, right, now you were called whores. Did you have a sexual past before you went into? This I had place? never, uh, uh, with the exception of the stepfather. Right. I had never had any. I was a virgin when I entered the program. I had never done drugs. I had never smoked cigarettes. You're a good student. I, w- I My grades had slipped after the issues had come out about my stepfather. I don't um, blame you. Well. But uh, so, but you were called a whore. I was. In fact, my the feminine smell that came from me is what enticed what happened in my home. And if I had been more, they godly, blamed you. Indeed, I for was your blamed. stepfather molesting you. Correct. Yes. And if I had walked the line with God, then uh, maybe that would not have happened. And um, were were kids beaten there? They were. Oh, they, were. They, 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 they paddled you? They did. In one instance, a uh, girl and I had tried to run away, and we were at a camp up in Tennessee. And uh, when we all got found and, and brought home, um, the entire home was reprimanded. Uh, girls had to stand in line. They were forced to lay down on the couch, uh, girls holding arms and legs and holding the other girls down screaming. And uh, the elder of the home, the lady that ran the place for the most part, I would come in with a paddle and she would raise it up as high above her hands as she could like a samurai sword and come down as hard as she could on your on your fanny or on your back or on your legs or wherever it was she managed to, to land it. What if you were to try to escape? You don't want to be paddled. You try to run. You try to make a run for it. You you, you thrash around so they so you're not paddled. What would happen to you then? Yeah, there there were girls that had tried to escape the beatings or and and you really can't. Um, there were enough girls there who were willing to uh, restrain you because they didn't want the beating themselves. And you had to do that, right? You had to restrain other girls lest you be beaten yourself. I did restrain other girls, yes. And uh, they forced you to do that. And and the, how does that make you feel about yourself at that time? You don't mind my asking. Yeah, you know, it, the beatings were one thing, um, but when I had to become a perpetrator, it, it was very different for me. It was um, something that I did not enjoy doing and that I, I was very uncomfortable with. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Teresa, uh, you gave a very powerful, powerful speech at the rally yesterday. Um, I'm going to post that on my website. We're going to let people listen to what you had to say. Thank you. Um, if you had just a few words for the people who are listening to this, who really have no idea that this stuff goes on. I mean, I mean, I mean, most of us, I certainly was not aware mm-hmm. that these abuses were this severe uh, until I got involved in this issue. And I, I dare say the vast majority of Americans have no idea that right. this stuff goes on. What what would you ask them to do? Wow. I mean, there's so much that needs to be done. And I feel like um, the biggest obstacle that we have right now is our is the fact that most of these children mm-hmm. are have been discredited. And so a lot of what they're telling people, people don't believe them. And, and that is a horrible position to be in, to not have anybody believe you, your parents, the, whole, uh, the law enforcement, uh, which in my case, in my home in particular, was called on several occasions. No, um, you went to the police yourself? I did. I went to the police department there, and I also went to the uh, Children's Services Agency. Did you escape agency. To, to do that? Because they, won't, they won't was let very you, unique. They won't let you call the police. <laughs> no, no. You had no access to phones, television. Playing cards were demonic. Um, playing cards were demonic. Playing cards were demonic. That so you had your life. Bible. I love playing cards. Yes, indeed. I do too now. So now that I know the truth. and that was So, so, so you got out. I did. How'd you get out? I became very clever and very manipulative uh, while I was in the home uh, for survival home? reasons. How long were you in the home? I was there at that particular location for eight months. Eight months, mm-hmm. okay. Um, I had begged my parents to take me home, and it just didn't seem to be working. As much as I promised them that I was saved and a Christian and that things were different, I wasn't different. I hadn't done anything to deserve to go there to begin with. So I learned that I didn't have to beat people or take beatings as long as I faked that I was sick. Uh, that was your out. That was my out. 
So you pretended to be sick. I pretended to be sick. And, and you this actually, went on for a while. For several months. Yes. Like you said. And then finally, and, and I started to cut the story short because I want to get to Lee's story as well. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they actually took a healthy appendix out of you. They did. Because you claimed to have appendicitis. They did. But that got you out of the home. It did get me out of the home. A healthy appendix was removed when I was 16 years old. And then you went and um, you actually did report this to police. I did. And I did, they, the did they arrest the ho people at the home, shut nope. it down? they are still there. In fact, they removed the girls from the home, and I thought that it had been closed down, but they have relocated to Texas, and that is where they are owned and operating right now. What's the name of the home in Texas? I believe it is still Charity Haven. I am not sure. Okay. And the same people are running and doing the same thing today to other that is correct. Girls. Yeah. And the police didn't arrest anybody. No. Did they tell you they me. tell you why? They said they just said they don't believe you? They we my mother had had put me in so many places up until that point uh -huh. that my my credibility was gone. So even I though you you did nothing wrong, the fact that they put you in all these places destroyed your credibility to say that all these places were, or at least particularly this last one, was terrible. The fact that we were put in all these places has destroyed my entire life, Mark, and I'm just so grateful for people like you that have nothing, no reason to do this, but to get this story out. And we are so grateful for you. Thank you, Teresa. I appreciate yes, that. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Thank you for your listeners as well. Uh, listen, thank you so we're much. We're going to do something about this. We're going to pass legislation to stop these places. Excellent. It may take some time, but we're going to work on it until it's done. And I'm not going to let this issue go. I gave up. Until until we're done. Yeah. Thank you. It's really a pleasure thank meeting you. you. I'm very excited. If you go out, get Lee to come in. We'll just have a few minutes left with her. Okay. Um, and um, folks, I can't tell you the emotions. Uh, this happens to be, just go ahead. That's fine. Uh, a, women here today, but uh, they're boys that have suffered this too. They're from all over the country. Uh, and each story is a little bit different, but you can hear these are innocent people that are being and have been tortured and abused. And it's going on right here in America. And the question is, how are we going to stop it? What are we going to do about it? Is Lee coming in? Um, Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought Lee wanted to be interviewed. That's why I uh, I went ahead and... Uh, all right. So, um, tell you what. Let's take a break. Okay. When we get back, we'll talk more about that. Folks, okay. if you want to call in, it's 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. you got just a few minutes left. We'll be right back, right after this. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine. I'm afraid, actually, that's all the time we have. I was going to interview Steve Kimbrough, but we just ran out of time. So this is the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine. If you want to take action to stop this abuse, I encourage you to do so. It's 202-225-3121's Congressional Switchboard. Ask your member of Congress to support Stop Abuse in Residential Treatment Centers. Act now because these kinds of things are continuing and we have to stop these stories. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. You can watch this show and any other show I've done at MarkLevineTalk.com. Follow me on Twitter at MarkLevineTalk. And we'll be right back next week for more of the Inside Scoop on We Act Radio AM 1480.